Colleran, and welcome to the third and final episode of the Making Arts Accessible series. This time we're talking about technology and access. We'll be talking to brilliant guests Robert Softly Gale, Jane Gauntless, Wando Abise, and John Kelly about how technology has been enabling and also asking if they have any critique about technology in the way it's currently used and the way it's developing. First up, I spoke to Robert Softly Gale, who's the Artistic Director of Birds of Paradise Theatre Company, based in Glasgow. Hi, Robert. Hi, Mangy. How are you? I'm good, love. And yourself? Very good. Very good. Lovely to have you here. First of all, Robert, and for the people who maybe, you know, have been asleep for a little while or whatever, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about the company and the kind of work? That you make? Yes, uh, Birds of Paradise have been going for about 29 years now, so quite a long time, we're quite old. And it came out of um, Glasgow was the city of culture in 1990, and that was obviously great, there's a lot of activity, and there was a lot of cultural stuff going on for disabled people. And then after that, there was a lot of disabled people saying, OK, what can we do now? Like, how can we keep going? How can we develop as performers, you know, be that in whatever capacity? So another company helped set up Birds of Paradise. It's a way for physically disabled people to develop skills as performers and theatre makers. And then over the years we've changed quite a lot. We still do sort of development and training stuff, but we also now cure around Scotland and around the world with big scale productions. And we also support other companies to develop their inclusive practice, whatever that means. So what kind of access provision can an audience member say expect us a bit of Paradise show? It really depends on the show. We obviously we want to make every show as accessible as possible. We we never claim a hundred percent accessibility. If that doesn't exist, there's no point in promising something that you can't do. Um, but what we always try to do is integrate BSL, integrate audio description, and integrate captions into the show. And also offer relaxed performances or relaxed environment in the show. But it really depends upon the show itself. So, for example, we did my record for a couple of years ago, which was a, a big scale musical. Now, you can do a lot in that format, and we can be a show on stage, we had captions, we had AG. But trying to get a relaxed performance of, of a musical is, it can be done, and we can do it, but it's limited because everything's about volume and about, you know, precise. So I guess what I'm saying is that we, we can't get everything all the time. We can't make everything 100% accessible, but we do as much as we can within what we're trying to achieve. So that kind of brings me to the next question really is, is how important, how do you use technology in your shows? We use it a lot. Um, I'm a bit of a geek, like when I went to uni, I studied computer science for the first couple of years. I then get that because all of the other folk in the class were quite boring. <laughs> <laughs> But, I, you know, I've got this geeky thing in me that I love technology, I love trying things. So we, so we do integrate tech as much as we can, and I like to geek out with production folk and writing folk. So, for example, in Wendy House, the first show that I did for Books and Paradise, the BSL was on a TV screen inside the set, and at that point, TVs on stage were quite... It was, quite, it was quite a new and quite funky idea. Um, we use projection a lot and we get a lot of, sort of big scale projections. So something like Purpose of Movements, which was a dance piece that we did at the Edinburgh International Festival, use big projectors to really get a lot of stuff on stage and also can make it accessible through captions. 
So yeah, we did use cake as much as we can. I, however, I also am quite a big believer in theatre being about people connecting to people. So I also, I never want cake to get in the way of that. I never want the technology to stop the actor from connecting to the audience. Right. So it's almost about that balance. That's interesting, actually. Um, that kind of brings me to my next question, in a way, to ask you, how do you feel that technology has enabled the, the kinds of work that you do in terms, both artistically and in terms of access for both maybe the performers on stage and the audience? Well, yeah, I've already spoken about the audience a bit, and I think, yeah, the way that we, that we integrate captions and PSL I think, and audio reception, I think we've used technology, you know, for example, purposeless movements, um, which I, I guess it's a physical movement piece. So I didn't, in, in the show before that, the audio reception had been for the whole audience, had been part of the show, but in a gang piece, I wanted the, the sighted audience to be able to come to their own conclusions about what they were watching and about what was, what, what resonated for them. So, so the audio description was done over headsets to the audience members to require that. And um, so a more traditional approach, but it felt right for that show. So yeah, in that way, we use technology to make it as accessible as we can without overburdening it with all of the tech that we can, you know? Yeah, and in fact, it was one of your shows, you'll have to excuse me, you'll have to tell me the title up. It's one of your shows that I first saw where audio description was not done, it was actually done for the entire audience. Yeah, I think that was Wendy Hoos. The, the sex comedy? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I actually saw the version of the show Wendy House and it was actually the first show that I actually saw with it, I've seen quite a bit of disability for you, so, that actually used audio description for everyone to hear. One of the, one of the great things about Wendy was because it was a sex comedy involving, <laughs> a, involving a disabled woman, so right away the audience are a little bit uncomfortable and they're a little bit going, oh God, what's coming next? And, mm -hmm. and oh my. So when you get an audio describer, you can then, you can call out that discomfort. Yes. And you can make, you can make even more of it. And that becomes even funnier. So there's a bit with this disabled woman who's got no legs and getting a van breaker out from under her bed. <laughs> now, now, some of the audience, some of the audience are already going, oh my God, what's coming next? But if you've got the audio describer going, here comes a whopping great big vibrator, then you, 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 you're acknowledging that discomfort and you're then able to do more with it. So I think, yeah, the writer Johnny did a fantastic job in, in making that work so well for the audience. Right, that's very interesting. It's kind of just speaking to your geek side. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, so I'm putting you on the spot slightly. But is there a, a, a piece of technology, a form technology, that you wish were available? That, that's a great question. It's a really hard one to answer. I mean, the technology that we use is about making the work we do more accessible to most people. So. <coughs> and BSL, Captions, Iggy, it's about making these tools more accessible by by bringing them to the audience closer and, and by letting that audience member access the work. Now, you could argue that that, that could go even further. So, for example, imagine there was a piece of technology that every time I got on stage, it listened to my voice and it made my voice clear so that the whole audience can make out what I was trying to say and then it would be a much clearer experience. Now, on first glance, you think, well, that would be great, that would be really useful. But, but actually, a big part of what I do 
is get on stage with a speech impairment and force the audience to listen to me. You know, it, yes, and, 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 and I'm very aware that they won't always get what I'm saying and I make a lot of jokes about that and we, we use that and we do all sorts of stuff because, because that's what we're going to do. So that's where we need to be careful that just because we can do something doesn't mean that we always should. That's really interesting way to add and actually thank you Robert for your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks Robert. That was great. Next, I speak to artist Jane Gauntlet. Hiya Jane. Hi Mandy. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I'm very pleased to meet you. Yeah, and you love and you. Right. First of all, I'd like to ask you, can you tell us please about the kind of work that you make, Jane? So this is a question that I've been thinking about quite a lot, actually. Um, I've just taken a few weeks off to have a think about my work because I haven't thought about my work for a while. Um, And I've been thinking about it as actually the work that I've made and the work that I'm making and the work that I want to make, sort of that's what I'm exploring at the moment. But I realise that what I do is I write stories. Right. Um, And then I explore different ways to tell those stories. And I think that that's very much what I do, even though I'm thinking, you know, I'm rethinking everything. That's very much what I do. That's great. And can you just tell us a little bit more then about what the kind of work maybe that you've, you've, you've produced before? So I've written stories for stages. And I've used candles and headphones and virtual reality headsets and blindfolds and mixed reality headsets, um, which specifically HoloLens and Magic Leap. Um, Those are the names of the headsets. And most of my work's been non-fiction. So recently I've been working on fictional pieces. Um, And then most recently I've been working, making work that uses post and parcels and audio. So I've gone from mixed reality to post. So would you say that technology has been enabling for you in terms of access as a disabled artist? I discovered video goggles in, I don't know, 2009 and they're old school headsets. Um, You wear them like glasses and they were terribly designed. But I was having, so I had a brain injury in 2007 and I have been living with epilepsy and epileptic seizures since then. Yeah. And I couldn't communicate with my medics and my loved ones what it was like to have an epileptic seizure. So I wanted to try to explore ways to demonstrate that using art and narrative. And it was very playful. It was never meant to go any further than my medical team and my friends, really. So we filmed, uh, so once I had a seizure on a train from. Oxford to London Paddington and I then sort of did an interpretation of that using an old camera and headphone and a dictaphone and turned that into a piece called In My Shoes Waking in Slough and that's how I started using headsets so it started off just as a um, it started off as an alternative method of communication I shouldn't say just as it was important but that's how I got into working in virtual reality and how would you say if at all the technology has worked in terms of for your audiences as well I think one of the big things has been making people feel comfortable in headsets. So, um, you know, regarding anxiety has been, you know, it's taking, um, it's really being aware of how people feel because putting on a headset is really stressful because um, you immediately feel like you are being watched or feel very vulnerable. So that can be a real trigger. I was lucky to make this piece roughly um, in my shoes waking in Slough for my friends. I learned a lot about that um, and making that piece. I learned a lot about the responses of audiences because we presented it in universities and hospitals and um, theatres and festivals. Um, but I think also when I'm talking to people about the work that they're making, it's access is not an afterthought. And if you think about it from the very concept and if you ask feedback um, from that moment, then that's how you can make a piece of work accessible. But it's also having feedback from 
so you know it's kind of getting the feedback at that stage yeah that's great I just wanted to tell you I saw um, a virtual reality piece by Laurie Anderson oh um, lucky you festival. Um, was, well it's for three years more now Again, and honestly it was the most amazing thing so I've not had any experience of virtual reality and it was about being on the moon and this was just amazing one of the things for me that was hilarious was at one point you were on a donkey on the moon and just the thought of me being sat on a powered wheel in a powered wheelchair on top of a donkey and I'm sure people must have been wondering why I was laughing but you know I mean that was just amazing you know it was just one yeah. of the most, you know, it's been one of the, the most powerful pieces of art in whatever form that I've ever witnessed, you know. And it was just very, was a very individual experience for me, but it was just amazing. Well, and what were your thoughts on access regarding that? Did you think it was an accessible piece? Do you think there was anything that could have made it more accessible? Um, for me, it was, it was fine. I mean, and there, there wasn't really, there was not much sound. So if you were... You know, if you were deaf, you didn't, you took, it, it didn't really, you know, it would have been accessible. Obviously, if you were a visually impaired person, it was not really accessible at all. And, you know, that's just the nature of the beast in that sense. So, um, so yeah, that, that, but it, I mean, it just was, you know, as I say, for me, things like sitting on a donkey is not something I'm ever going to do, you know. So, um, and, and you know just that walking like the sensation of walking even which isn't like anything I do either you know just that sense of, of being on the on the planet and exploring it is not something I'm ever likely to do you know as, as a disabled person as just generally most of us don't so yeah no I just loved it I'd say it's one of the most impactful things I've ever you know um, ever seen really I think it really challenges some of what I'm saying and I think it's really mm -hmm. great feedback because I think I've become hypercritical of VR and I think I'm sort of, um, I think sometimes I've been thinking so much about access that I found it tough to make the work because I think of the audience first and I think I was challenged by um, somebody I was working with and I said, you know, I'm thinking about the audience, I said, why are you thinking about them? It's your art. And I think that's so opposite yeah. the way I think about work. But I think actually, as much as I fight with him, he's a great artist, but as much as I fight with him, I do hear his voice in my head sometimes saying, why are you thinking about the audience first? Well, Jane, thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful to talk to you. And um, like, I think everyone listening would be really interested to hear and see the next piece of work that you, you, you bring out. Thank you so much for your time, Jane. No, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Thanks, Jane. That was brilliant. Next, we spoke to artist Wando Abise. Hello, my name is Wando Abise and I'm a multidisciplinary artist, curator. I make sound and music and worlds and write and perform. I'm doing quite a bit of tap dancing at the moment, which is quite exciting. Um, I'm interested in ritual and Afro-diasporic um, cultures and particularly um, connecting the past with possible futures and alternate realities, sci-fi, everything. I just like to, um, I like to try and make worlds and create liminal spaces for people to experience those worlds in. So I think in our culture, there's an assumption about what technology is, and it tends to be, um, it's machines, it's things that are electronic um, or mechanical, um, it's things outside of ourselves. In a way, it's quite often put on a binary as um, unnatural versus the natural, and that's not the way I think about technology. So I'm really interested in looking outside the global minority idea of technology to like indigenous ideas about technologies which um, will always be actually very 
human centered and and kind of nature centered because it's about connecting with your own environment to in order to to live so what happens when you're working with the idea of technology as something that's community centered that isn't about extraction and isn't about um what's working right now but what's going to work for future generations what's going to so it's moving forwards and backwards and sideways um and in that case you get to- technologies that might be quite centered around the body um they will involve the rituals of the culture they will um they might they might include dance they might include storytelling um but it's all about creating things that make other things work right that's what technology is so i guess going if we if we're working from the idea of low tech technologies i think that's the main way i find as a neurodivergent person that i am given access to artworks so if i experience an artwork in a space where the sensory nature of the space and the sensory nature of the experience hasn't been considered it's much harder for me to access the work um a simple thing might be in a museum where the you know the first consideration might have been to a certain type of aesthetic and maybe they make it very vaulted very spacious so it's got like a really massive echo and um it's a sound piece and they haven't thought about um the acoustics of the space and how that's going to work and then it might just be so cacophonous for me that it's not only impossible to experience the work but it's also actually painful so it's quite funny because those types of things are quite basic and i tend to find that if i'm with other people and i bring this up other people go oh yeah no i find that a bit difficult as well but it's just it's one of those things that's just so assumed that we have to accept it's a bit strange for me because i think well we could just make this better for one thing but also we don't know how many people d- just wouldn't ever attend something like this because they just know this is going to be painful i'm going to feel i might get a migraine i might start feeling loads of flash seeing loads of flashing lights which is something that can happen to me when sounds like that so i think that's one of the things that's one of the reasons why i'm really interested in the idea of like sensory access i think that in terms of my audiences i'm really it's it's like it's it's again it's one of these things it's a constant striving and needing to accept there's always going to be failure um i'm always trying to use different types of technology to make my work more more and more accessible and it's definitely not an add on it's quite often the inception of the work it's i don't feel like it's something to be considered i feel like it's the real heart of things um so that my that's and that's led me down certain types of work i think that's one of the things that's led me down um making works that go in galleries that are sound work so for example i was commissioned by yorkshire sculpture international and the hepworth in wakefield to make a piece and i made a kind of sonic guided journey which really made sense to me because there's already a possibility for people to experience it was it was it was to be connected with a retrospective of hepworth's work so people can see her work and people can listen to my piece at the same time and they're connected so it just makes sense to me as an experience because it means that yeah we're using the technology of um, sound technology and we're actually using um, immersive sound by by neural sound so people can feel more in their own little worlds but then i feel like there's a complete experience being created in the collaboration between me and the museum um that gives deaf people and blind people access to parallel works and i'm very interested in using technology in that way to make parallel experiences i think it's always important to think about 
the politics of, of, of hierarchy. And so for people who haven't been prioritised, say, in, 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 in art experiences, say, deaf or blind people or people in wheelchairs or neurodivergent people, so try and prioritise them. And if there are parallel experiences for them and people who aren't disabled, then to prioritise the disabled people and to think about the work a lot more from their point of view. In terms of the way technology is used for access, I think what it can't be is it can't be an excuse to be lazy. Like, making work accessible is difficult, but I think making work's difficult. I just, so I just I don't really see, like, it's, like, an extra difficult thing. It's just, like, another difficult thing. But it's also a potentially really creative and beautiful thing. And I think what I don't want to see is people making a work and then going, oh, and then let's just add in this technology and then and then we're done and then we pat ourselves on the back you know that's that's coming from this very privileged place and what have we learned needs to you know come from us needs to it needs to be really embedded from a work's inception you know you also get a problem which is that sometimes the technologies absolutely aren't made for the people that it's meant to benefit I remember there was there was like a bit of a it became a bit of a meme to me and it went did the rounds on social media and it comes back every now and again which is um, that somebody's created a system of turning sign language into sound so that so that people who aren't deaf can understand it. It's like, it's just so backwards. It's not for the deaf people. It's for people who aren't deaf. And it's like, there's enough for us. It's okay. We don't need another thing. And it's it's like saying, oh, but now they can communicate with us. But it's like, well, how about we communicate with people who use sign language? And it's, and it's really terrible because it's another kind of chipping away at sign language. Um, so... I think that's where it can get a bit, it's a little bit twisted and perverse, this idea of using technology to translate um, a disabled person's experience for somebody else for the benefit of the person who isn't disabled. In the speculative future that I believe in, it's definitely very much about the technology of the forgotten. So the technologies of the low-tech indigenous, um, the technologies of accessibility of neurodivergent people, of disabled people. Um, I think I think it all goes really hand in hand, and it and it's like if if all those things are taken into consideration, then they will be the technologies will be accessible, the technologies will be sustainable. They won't be about extraction, they won't be about capital, because none of those things are about capital. Um, so it's, it's, it's changing the ideas of technology to make them work for the people that society has not been made to work for. Thanks, Wando. That was really interesting. Finally, I spoke to musician John Kelly. Hiya, John. Hiya, Mandy. How you doing? I'm all right. Love yourself? Yeah, really good. Really good to be good, with you. Good, good. Yeah. OK, John, so can you tell us a little bit about what kind of work you make? Yeah, uh, so uh, essentially I'm a singer-songwriter. You know, I've been singing kind of all my life, really, uh, since I was a wee lad. I started singing when I was about eight, and then I was in and out of bands from my early teenage years um, as a bit of a hobby really you know just because I love music really and made mates and friends and did lots of gigging and playing around um, so I did it you know more as fun and a hobby and we went serious for a little while but didn't really get anywhere with it all in the um, early days and then I sort of gave up and got a proper job for a little while um, or tried to uh, that sounds a, horribly familiar, John. Yeah, well, I was a youth worker. Oh, wow. And and I really loved it because I was yeah. able to bring music into my youth work because, of course, music's great for engaging with young people. So 
I was always, you know, I've always still, I've always dabbled around the musical areas, if that doesn't sound too rude. And, um, yeah, so, um, and then about, um, I keep saying 10 years, but actually it's gone on a bit now. It's probably about 13 years ago that um, I got a bit of a, I, I knew Jenny, obviously Jenny Seely at Grey Eye, and uh, she just, there was one night, we, we were doing a bit of work at the Orpheus Centre in Godston, and she came up to me and she said, oh, look, we're looking for a bit of a, a singer to do this Ian Jury thing that was going on. And, uh, yeah, so I I kind of um, kind of got lucky with that, really. And uh, I um, realised that sort of after a couple of years of that, I was actually making music all the time and I wasn't doing any other work, really. A bit of consultancy, a bit of training, you know what it's like. Um, but, you know, the, my main breadwinner was music making. So um, that was brilliant. Can you tell us about the Kelly Caster, which I understand is a bespoke guitar that's been actually made for you personally? Well, kind of my, you know, my, my development, my kind of idea really in that I've always, I've always dabbled with playing instruments. I'm jack of all instruments and master of none of them. And um, I, um, I've always loved sort of guitar. Being Irish, my, my Irish heritage, I sort of fell in love immediately with the kind of romantic idea of sitting by a fire quite like we are at the moment with my tv fire behind me um in a pub just with an acoustic guitar and playing songs all night and and telling stories with with music so i've always had that kind of romanticism about music and that way of playing and so i Originally, I played like a little acoustic guitar with open cording, but it was quite limited. Um, and I've always played sort of keyboards and used technology, and I'm always buying bits of gear and bits of kit and experimenting. Um, so I kind of knew that there were different elements of the guitar that, if they were together, could work and do what I wanted it to do, which was essentially just be a guitar but play all the chords that I needed it to and respond in the way a guitar responds. So the Kelly Caster started off really as a kid <laughs> playing a tennis racket and a snooker cue and, <laughs> and, and, and kind of knowing that I could do that um, quite well in front of the mirror and all it needed was a couple of strings and then to be able to do what I needed on the strings and that's the design kind of yeah it was it was you know the guitar needs to be nice and light and thin and maybe a different body shape slightly and then I needed the strings to be able to do stuff and I knew there was some technology around that as I say individually could do bits of it but not all together and I looked at some you know guitar emulators and some things but they weren't they weren't robust enough they didn't have a good enough sound and, you know, I take my music seriously. I'm a professional musician, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it was important to me for it to sound good and right. And so the Kelly Castle was kind of born. Um, and I worked with Drake Music. They had this thing called yes. Hackmates. We had these things I used to go along to where artists and programmers used to come together in a little darkened room in... London and um, and I had some really collaborative um, experiences working with some brilliant, brilliant people. Mainly Charles Matthews was big on it, a, a guy who is a genius when it comes to programming and making apps and stuff. And together, along with lots of other people input in, came this beautiful guitar that that we got a bit of money for it because it it became something that became a bit precious and came i realized that suddenly i could play all these songs that i wanted to play and i could write new songs and use chords that i'd never used before so my songs became a lot more not elaborate because i'm still quite simple with me songs but 
you know, I could just give it a bit of a nuance or a bit of depth. Yeah. Quite often with technology, access and the use of technology by disabled people, even though everyone kind of assumes technology's changed our life. Yes. Yeah, all technology must have made a right difference to your life. Well, it did in many ways, but also I was still skint, so I couldn't afford all the technology that was out there. Yes. <laughs> technology is still related to accessing it in terms of being able to afford it. And, you know, poverty still means that, you know, a lot of disabled people don't get the kit they want. I think it's criminal that, yes. that, that children and young, young disabled adults still have to fundraise to get a communication device. You know, that's, that's a bit of technology that you think every disabled person who needs it should have, but they don't. So, you know, technology for disabled people, although it does change our lives, mm -hmm. we're, still, it's still, we're still thought of second with technology. You know, my, my, my technology in my van um, apparently came out of a tank. Wow. Um, so the first thought was how can we make this in you know a useful bit of equipment for war and you know <laughs> that that's where the money was and that's yes, where they use so you know disabled people and technology were always at, like a second thought and like access features are often hidden under the bonnet and people don't know about them until you dig around you know absolutely i know my powered wheelchair um i think the genesis of that was the golf buggy. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, you're right, John. And that's, I think you're also right about, you know, often the prohibitive costs. Yeah. Because I think also what happens, I think well, most to say people will be familiar with this, whatever your impairment is, as soon as it gets an access label on it, the price shoots up as well. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think one of the things I loved about the whole hack movement, if you like, yeah. There's that kind of DIY hack nature of things means that where it, it's too expensive and that expense is prohibitive, there's people that work together to make it more affordable. You know, my Telecaster software is on a GitHub, which means it's free. You know, that, yeah. so people that, people that know about that software or want to do stuff with that software, you know, we can send them the link and they can use it. And, Brilliant. make their own versions of it thanks John as always well thanks to all our guests on this episode so we've come to the end of the series so obviously I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed all the artists directors allies who've contributed to this series it's been very interesting to talk about these issues and hear about them it can sometimes seem like access is a bit of a tired thing that we've got past it by now. But we all know as disabled artists, practitioners and audience members just how important it is. And this series, I think, has been important to be able to give disabled artists a chance to have a conversation amongst ourselves about what the relevant issues are to us as practitioners, to us working with organisations, and also to us as potential audience members. I personally would like to thank the entire Unlimited team for their support in making this podcast series and particularly thanks to Harry Murdoch who's compiled, edited and produced this series and also given me a job. Thanks Harry. Okay, well I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks very much for listening. And yes, I'm sorry, we've never mentioned accessible toilets. Maybe next series. This podcast has been produced by Unlimited. Unlimited is delivered by Shape Arts and Arts Admin and is funded by Arts Council England, Creative Scotland, Arts Council of Wales and British Council.